I want to talk to you about a, um, about a, a subject that is um, appropriate for this week, and that is um, how to be thankful. How, how, do we, how do we become people that are thankful? Because how many know it's not, it's not natural for most people to be grateful? It's not natural for most to be thankful. But what I want to talk to you about today, I can make you a couple of promises. Number one, if we will, if we will do what the Bible says do about what we're going to talk about today, number one, it'll make us better people. How many want to be better? Say yes. It'll make us happier people. How many want to be happier? Say yes. And then the third thing, it'll make you more attractive. How many want to be more attractive? It'll make you more tra- Tell somebody beside you, if you get any more attractive, I don't think I can stand it. Just- <laughs> yeah, I promise you, it'll, it, it'll do that for you. But, 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 but you know, it, we're going to talk about a lot of good stuff. But first of all, let me, let me just ask you a question. How many of you are tired of all the negativity in the world? It's tired of, I mean, it's negative everywhere. Everywhere you look, everything you listen to, people just complain. It's like complaining has become an art form in the church. It's a spiritual gift. People are looking for what's wrong rather than looking for what's right. And how many know there's nothing right about that? Anybody can find what's wrong. It doesn't take a smart somebody to find out what's wrong with people. But it takes an intentional person. To look for what's right. And you know what that's called? It's called a heart of gratitude. It's called a a grateful heart. A heart filled with with, with thanksgiving. But but we live in this this world. I mean, people complain about everything. We complain about the weather. It's too hot. Now it's too cold. It's too wet. No, now it's too dry. It's too humid. People in Southern California complain. Another beautiful day. Can you believe it? It's just too perfect. I mean, people, people com- complain about, about almost, almost everything. I mean, it's like people think they carry around a gift to, uh, to, com- to complain. You go to a fast food restaurant, somebody else is serving your food, they're cooking your food, they prepared your food to be cooked, but if it takes more than three minutes, you complain about it. I don't, we, we, drive, we drive our cars at home and we push a button and a door opens and we drive our car into that garage, we close the door, we get out of our car, we complain about the gas mileage on the car that we knew the gas mileage before we bought the car. And then we walk into a house that has a controlled environment When it's hot outside, it's cool inside. When it's cold outside, it's warm inside. And we walk to a refrigerator that's usually full of food, and we say, I have nothing to eat. We sit down in the living room, and we turn on the television, and there's 137 channels, and we say, there is nothing on TV. And then we go to our bedrooms, and we touch every piece of clothing in our closet, and we say, I don't have anything to wear. And I just, I just think it's important, you know, going into this season that we, can, that we, we need to talk about how blessed, you know, how, how blessed we can be, but, but how ungrateful we often are. And I want to I just spend some time talking about that because you're probably, you know, more like me than you think, and I'm probably more like you than I think, and, and that is that, you know, we're, we're not just grateful people by nature. It, it's, no, it's, it's not something that's wired into all of us at birth. We have to, we, 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 become, we become grateful. And I, I think that, you know, we would also say that I want to be postured for gratefulness. I want to be positioned to have a heart that is thankful. I want to be, I want to be, you know, in a frame of mind that, that my heart is truly thankful for, for what I've been given. In fact, if you study gratefulness or if you study thankfulness, you know, you'll find that psychologists and people who study human behavior and study the mind, they will tell you that gratefulness is the value that opens up the door. It unlocks other positive or great values in, in your life. When, when you're grateful, it helps you to be more generous. Everybody wants to be more generous because it really is better to give than it is to receive. When, when, when we're thankful, it, it, it helps us to be more encouraging towards people. I mean, I mean, gratitude, it unlocks. Gratefulness unlocks. 
these other positive values or, or areas in, in, our, in our life. And, and I'm just asking the Lord during this season. I thought about it this week, and I hope you'll, you'll join me and just ask the Lord to transform whatever areas of their, there are in my heart. Maybe there's some in your heart that, that sometimes can just feel entitled or ungrateful, like I deserve that. When I go home and I push the button and my garage door opens, yeah, I deserve that. No, I don't. Today I get to drive home instead of walk home in a car that I own. Well, I worked hard. I deserve that. No, I don't. I just, I just pray that whatever area of my life, maybe there's some in your life, that the Lord would just transform them and, and give us you know, an attitude that, that reflects a grateful heart. Because here's what I know. There are millions of people in the world who will never, ever, ever, and it's a tragedy, people all over the world who will never experience a true heart of gratitude. And I'm going to talk about that for a few minutes. I'm going to use a story, a common story that um, many of you have heard. Um, Luke, um, a writer in the, the Gospels, a writer of the New Testament, he he writes his story, and in the story, he gives an account of these 10 lepers, people with leprosy, who have this encounter with Jesus. But, it, but it's really a, a story um, that we see, you know, a real um, lack of gratitude. I mean, it's, it's tragically lacking in this story. And I want to just, just paint the, the picture for you and Talk about these guys who encountered Jesus. Here's, here's where it begins in, in Luke 17, verse 11. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the, the, the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into the village, how many, how many people? Ten. Ten men who had leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, have pity on us. And, and, you know, sometimes we read, like, this story, and because maybe we've heard it before, maybe we've read it before, it's real easy to take this story and just kind of read over it and say, yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard that before. But that, that's not good, because if you do that, you don't understand the context of the story, nor do you understand the power that's represented in the story. You have to understand these men. Ten men eat up with leprosy. If you study leprosy, if you go back to the Old Testament, Leviticus, I think, chapter 13, I believe, it tells us, a lot about leprosy. It tells us people with leprosy literally had to rip their own clothes. Their, their clothing had to be torn so that people in a distance could see them coming and they would recognize, hey, don't get too close to them because they have leprosy. People who had leprosy, they weren't allowed to keep their hair. They couldn't cut their hair. They couldn't comb their hair. They couldn't shampoo their hair. Don't know why, except to identify them as people who were diseased and you didn't need to get too close to those people. People with leprosy, they couldn't open their mouths because they were afraid of, of, of the, the infection and the disease, you know, getting on to, to, other, to other people. People who had leprosy, if they got within a certain distance of other people, they would have to, to shout out, unclean, unclean, unclean. So people didn't get too, too, too close to them in, 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 those, in those settings. Can you imagine? I mean, can you just... Can you imagine the pressure of that kind of rejection? I mean, can you imagine the internal pressure of the, the, the physical pressure from your disease? Can you imagine the external social pressure of, of, of that disease? I mean, they, 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 they tell us, you know, they used to tell us that leprosy was a disease that ate away your body, but I think it was in the 50s they did some more research and they said, you know, leprosy really isn't about that it eats away your skin. Leprosy is really... A disease that, that kills your nerves, that attacks the nerves in your body, and it kills the nerves in your body. And because you can't feel anything, you don't know how to take care of your skin. They say that at night, people with leprosy would, would lay around, and literally rats would come and eat away their toes and eat away their fingers. And the reason the rats could do this is because the feeling in their body, the nerves were dead, and they couldn't tell there was anything attacking their bodies. Can you imagine the position that these people must have been in? Can you imagine for year after year after year having no human intimacy, not even having someone be able to come and give you a hug? 
Can you imagine the pressure these, these men are under when they see Jesus? I mean, these are people without hope, and all of a sudden, hope's walking down the road. Maybe there's a hope. Maybe there's a I mean, their hope's gone. It's lost. Their hope of having a happy future is gone. And now they see hope coming down the road. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus would have pity on us, and maybe Jesus would heal us. So they cry out, Master, have pity on us. Verse 14 says, when he, Jesus, when he saw them, he said, go, show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now listen, I'm not going to preach about that today. But that is a great sermon right there. Because what he's talking about is what we always say, obedience always precedes the miraculous. Jesus said, go, and they went. Jesus didn't, they, he didn't say be healed. Jesus didn't heal them while they were present. Jesus didn't heal them until they were obedient to what Jesus told them to do. A lot of you are waiting for miracles in your life. You're waiting on God to come through for you, but you've yet to be obedient to him. And I'll t- say it, and I'll say it, and I'll say it, and I'll say it again, again, and again. Listen, obedience always precedes the miraculous. Don't come calling for your miracle until you've first been obedient. All I'll say about that. One of them, how many, how many were there? Ten. Ten were cleansed. Ten were healed. Then he says, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him and, this is key, he was a Samaritan. Why is that so important? Because in those days, Samaritans didn't associate with Jews. Samaritans, they they certainly didn't hug and they didn't throw themselves at the feet. They didn't even communicate with one another. So a Samaritan, Jesus said, wasn't, there's a problem here. Wasn't there 10 who were healed? Yes, sir. Only one returned? Yes, sir. And he's the one by all social status should not have returned. Yes, sir. A tragic example of a lack of gratitude. And Jesus is really saying in this story, there's a problem. It's powerful because they're miraculously transformed. They go from no hope to a chance of of life all over again. And only one of them comes back to say thanks to Jesus. And I don't know about you. I think it's probably true of all of you, but I want, to, I want you to know for sure it's true about me. I want my life and I want my heart and I want my mind to always be postured in a position of gratitude. Because listen, listen, if you're not grateful, you will become entitled. And when you become entitled, you're in trouble. It's important to posture your life, your heart, your mind, towards gratitude, towards thanksgiving. Because if not, it'll just come, well, I deserve that. I should have that. I worked hard for that. That's mine. I'm better than them. I worked harder than them. I outsold them. I outworked them. He has one. I should have one too. That's entitled. We're not, in, we're not entitled. The breath you breathe, you're not even, I'm not even entitled to breathe. It's a gift from God that I get to breathe God's air. I'm not entitled to breath because he gave me life one day. It's a heart of thanksgiving, a heart of, 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 of gratitude. One of them, the Bible says, came back. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we live like grateful lives? How do we live thankful? I'm going to give you three statements today. And if we apply these three statements, I promise you, I promise you they'll transform your attitude about gratitude. The, the second thing I'm going to do is tell you a story. And then I'm going to give you an assignment. And, and I hope that it'll, it'll leave us happier. It'll leave us better and it'll make us more attractive because how many know grateful people are attractive people? You ever notice ungrateful people are unattractive people? 
Nobody's ever attracted to an ungrateful spirit, but everybody's attracted to a heart of gratefulness. We need to be good looking people, amen? amen? Here we go. Number one, write this down if you're taking notes. First comment that I hope you'll make, maybe you'll put it on your mirror in your car, put it on your mirror in your bathroom, put it on your, on your screensaver, I, I don't know. Put these three statements somewhere where you'll look at them every day. They're not new, I didn't make these up. You can go to all kind of books and you can find them. They're out there everywhere. I'm just reminding you of some of the things that I found. Number one, I know every good thing I have comes from God. I say it all the time. I know every if it's good, it's from God. If it's good, it's from God. That's what, what James said whenever he, he said in James 1, 17, every good, every perfect gift comes from God. Every good and perfect, if it's good, if you have it in your life and it's good, listen, it came from God. I told the first service, I love the way my mom and my dad exemplify this in, in their life. My dad, you ever ask him, how, how, how's it going, dad? How you doing? Oh, I'm good, I'm good. No, dad, really, how you doing? Oh, I'm good, I'm good. I'm good. Dad, how you doing? Things aren't so good. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> then he just laughs. I'm good. I mean, sometimes he's so good it's annoying that he's good. You know what I mean? He's like annoyingly good. All the time, just, just good. And I'm, I'm like, there's times dad's had some you know, significant health issues with his heart, with blood pressure and, and those things. And, and I'm like, Dad, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. I said, no, Dad, things really aren't that good. How you doing? Oh, but I'm good. I'm good. My mom, she just recently had had some back surgery and during that surgery she had a she had a little stroke and and that stroke took away took away the the communication from her brain to part of her eyes and all of her peripheral vision to the left all of it's gone and um she's, she's got about 20 percent of of um of what she can see forward she told me the other day son you've never looked so good <laughs> she's no, she, she didn't. She'll get mad at me for saying that. Scott, people are going to believe you. Mom, they don't believe half of what I say. I promise you. <laughs> listen, listen. But my mom, if you go ask her today, Mom, how you doing? Gail, how you doing? Oh, I'm so blessed. I am so It's just a little setback. I've still got this, and I've still got that. I've still got, look at all I've got. It's just a little thing. And you know what? God's going to heal her. He's going to restore it anyway. Amen. He's going to give it back to 100%. But, but I love that because they're so encouraging. There's such a heart of gratitude in the middle of difficult things. They're, they're still grateful and, and they're still happy about, you know, about what the Lord has done for them. And, and um, it's like people, people who get saved late in life sometimes are great, more grateful than people who got saved earlier in their lives. Because people who got saved late in life, they're like, you have no idea what the Lord has saved me from. You have no idea what I've been forgiven from. And, and I get to spend the rest of my life as the best of my life, telling people how good God is to me. It, it's my, my, my brother-in-law, Kevin, he went through some difficult years up front in his life, and you know he, he had some strong addictions in his life, and he didn't make some of the best decisions in his life, but man, he got delivered, he got set free, he got victory over all that stuff in his life, and right now, that dude's the happiest guy on the planet. You can't, you can't hardly get him down. He's like, I know, what it, I know what it's like to live in defeat. I know what it's like to live addicted, but I've been set free, and I get to live the rest of my life giving people encouragement about being set free. Oh, the day may not be good, but life sure is good. You're not going to take away my grateful heart. That's what, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm, I'm talking about. Listen, if it's good, it's from God. If you get a, listen, if you've cheated death, every day you live ought to be good. If you got out of an accident that should have killed you, if you overcame a disease that should have taken you, if you overcame something in your life that should have taken your out, you out and you're still walking in, you ought to be grateful because every day of your life is a reminder that you cheated death and you ought to be grateful. Powerful. In fact, did you know that if you, if you look in the Bible and you start looking back, everybody that, everybody that ever did anything good for God did it because of something good God gave them first. Did you, did you know that? I mean, you look at Noah. Noah built an ark. Listen, Noah built an ark that not only saved his family, it literally saved humanity. He was good. No, God was good because God's the one that told him the flood was coming and God gave him the gift of the plan to build that ark and God gave him the gifts to put the ark together. Noah only did what he did because of what God gave him first. The children of Israel, 
I mean, they, they walked around in the wilderness for 40 years. Aren't they good? No, they're, they're only good because of what God gave them. God gave them a pillar of fire by night that kept them warm, and he gave them manna every, every morning to feed their bellies. David, boy, wasn't he a mighty warrior? No, God gave him a slingshot, and God gave him a stone so he could take out Goliath. What about Jonah? Jonah, Jonah did some great things. He went, well, yeah, no, God gave him a good fish. Listen, God gave him a fish to swallow him up and drop him off safely at the shoreline in the city that he was supposed to go preach the gospel. Isn't God something? Look at, look at Mary, that little teenage girl, little teenage girl. She was a virgin. God gave her the faith to say, yeah, I don't mind carrying the Savior of the world in my womb. Look at the, I mean, look at the, the, the wise men. How did they get to Jesus? The only way they made it to Jesus is because God gave them a star. Everything good comes from God. And we have to remember, say it every single day. Remind ourselves, if it's good, it came from God. Look at what God's given us. He gave us the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He gave us the lion and he also gave us the lamb. He gives you, if you'll receive it, a peace that goes beyond all other humans' understanding. He gives us the Holy Spirit, which is our comforter, our counselor, our convictor, and our guide. If, it, if it's good, it came, it came from God. And I know you're like, well, hey, no, not everything, because I worked hard for what I got. See, she said it right. He woke you up to go to work. I'll write that in my notes. Hold on. <laughs> but think about it. I'm, yeah, you, you did good, but at best, yeah, at best, you only, listen, at best, you only succeeded because you were a good steward of what God gave you first. You're not that good. You didn't make your own brain. God gave it to you. You didn't make your own hands. God gave them to you. And when you succeed or I succeed at best, listen, you better know this because if you don't know it, you'll get filled with pride and pride will knock you out. At best, when we succeed, we've succeeded because we've just been good stewards of what God gave us first. Say it every every day. Listen, these comments, I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not getting this isn't rocket science. These are just some comments. That if you'll say them, they'll change you. Everything I have that's good came from God. Remind yourself of that. Number two, second comment I think is important for you to say is, is I won't, listen, this is, don't, don't miss this. I won't let what I want rob me of what I have. I refuse to allow what I want to rob me of, of, of what, I, what I, all, I already have. Now, there's a lot of people, and I don't know what, what you want, but you know, I know a lot of people want a newer house. They want a bigger house. They want a nicer car. They want a, they want a newer car. They want to travel more. Some of them want to travel less. Some of them want new clothes. Some of them want just, they just want different clothes. I want this. I want that. I, I want, I want, I want. Listen, you have to be real careful not to let what you want rob you of the blessing that, that you already have. Somebody tell me, who's the wisest man that ever lived? Solomon, King Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. In Ecclesiastes, he wrote a book, and his book's in the Bible. It's called Ecclesiastes, and in his book, in in chapter 6 and verse 9, listen to what what he said. Anybody ever heard this saying, a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush? Anybody ever heard that? Come on, y'all hadn't heard that? You, You know where it came from? Solomon, listen, listen, Solomon said it first. He didn't actually say a bird in the hand, but, but here's what he said. He said, better what we see with the eye than the roving of the appetite. That's how he said it first. Better what we see with our eye than the roving of our appetite. Better what we see, in other words, better what we have in front of us. Better what we have 
than the roving of our eyes. Better what we have than what we're always wanting. Because how many know you, if, if, you're, if you are led by what you always want, you'll never be happy because you'll always want more. He says, he says better what we see than the roving of the, of the appetite. In other words, your appetite's never going to be satisfied for what you want. So he said, it's, it's better to learn to be content, learn to be happy, learn to be satisfied with what's in front of you, a bird in the hands better than two in the bush. Be led by what you have rather than allowing what you want to rob you of, of what's right there in, in front of you. Never let what you want rob you of, 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 what, you, of what, you, what you have. Because you, when, you, when you live that way, do you know what gratitude does in your life? you know what thankfulness does in your life? We have thanksgiving every year. you know what thanksgiving does in our life when we're thankful, when we're grateful? Gratefulness turns what you have into enough. Entitlement. Entitlement will always make you feel like you don't have enough because you don't have what you deserve. Gratefulness, thankfulness, a thankful heart, an attitude of thanksgiving will turn what you have in your life into enough. People say, well, I'm gonna, I'll be grateful when I, when, I get, when I get happy. No, you won't. People think happy people are grateful people. No, listen, happy people are not grateful people. Happiness never, never, listen, happiness never produces gratefulness. Gratefulness always produces happiness. Don't ever get those confused. Don't ever, well, when I get happy, then I'll be grateful. No, you won't. Because, because happiness never produces gratefulness. Gratefulness always produces happiness in our life. That's why we say, God, help me to be postured. Help me to be positioned, to have a heart that's filled with, with gratitude. I remember a few um, weeks ago, whenever we were doing that pastor's conference in, in France, um, we were getting ready to leave. It was the last night there. It was cold, bitter cold, and it was raining. We had to get from downtown Paris out to a hotel by the airport because we were leaving early in the morning, and we had two big cars, and, and, and our car left first, and the car that left behind us got to the airport or to the hotel before us, and our driver was charging us more than their driver. That meant that our driver was literally taking us for a ride, and I didn't like it. And I started arguing with the driver. I'm like, no, you're not going to take advantage of us. Man, you're not, no, we don't speak your language, but you're not taking advantage of us. It doesn't take rocket science to figure out. We left first. We got there last. They charged us less. You're trying to rip us off. And I found myself arguing with the cab driver who speaks about that much English. And all of a sudden, it hit me. It hit me. I'm allowing what I want, which is to be right, which is to not be taken advantage of, to rob me of what I had, which is a ride in Paris on a cold, rainy night. <laughs> How many know paying more beats walking in the rain? But you know what happened in that moment? My heart wasn't postured towards gratitude. And I allowed what I wanted to rob me of what I had. And I had to apologize to that man because I was wrong. It's, a, it's a really, really important. I mean, when you think about what you, what you have, most of us in this room, when you think about what we have, listen, almost everybody in this room, if, if you want three meals a day, you can get three meals a day. Some of you are going on four, and you're going on five, and you need to cut back to three. But, 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 you, but you can, if you, but you can if, you, if you want to. I mean, almost everybody in this, in this room has a car. You have a, you have a car. That makes you the exception to, to almost every other country in the world and the people who, who live there. You have, you have shoes. I mean, for crying out loud, you don't have a shoe. You have shoes. You have shoes you work in, shoes you run in, shoes that you play in, shoes that you go to the beach in. You have high heel shoes and high heel shoes. You have lots Lots of shoes, you know, you have like a lot of shoes. 
I mean, if you have more than one pair of shoes, did you know that that makes you extraordinarily more blessed than the vast majority of the world? You have a job. If you have a job, listen, if, I didn't ask you if you liked your job. I just said if you have a job. If, listen, if you have, don't miss this, if you have a job and you make minimum wage on your job, that means that you are making 32 times more per hour than almost all of the world. How's that for perspective? When we, when we think about what we, what we have and how blessed we, we are, and I mean, you, have a, you have one of these, you have a phone. Like that we carry around with us. And I can do more than just talk on this. I can be on the other side of the world FaceTiming my family. But it's more than, than, just, than just talking on it. I can, I can push a few buttons and somehow a signal goes into heaven and a pizza that gets delivered at my house. How most of us in this room are blessed with our health right now. You have healthy bodies that's free from pain. You know what, you know what everyone needs to do? At least a few times in your life. Listen, everybody needs to leave our country, go to another country, go to a developing country. And when you get around the people in that developing country, you'll find out they don't have any of the things that I just talked to you about. Talking about, you get around people that are Jesus people. Go and do a mission trip. Go with somebody who found Jesus over in that country. You know what you'll do? You'll spend the first few hours, maybe the first day, feeling sorry for these people. How can they live without, how, that, they don't even have, and you call home, oh, I can't believe it, they don't even have. You feel sorry for them. But when you're there for a couple of days, all of a sudden, you're looking around and you stop feeling sorry for them and you start feeling sorry for yourself because you have so much but have so little and they have so little but you begin to see, oh, they have so much. It's, it's powerful. It's a, a, a powerful position that we live in when we have an attitude or heart that, that's truly filled with, with gratitude. Listen, gratitude will turn what you have. Thanksgiving will turn what you have. Gratefulness will turn what you have into enough. Happy people aren't grateful people, but grateful people are always happy people. Number three, let me give you the, the third one. The third one is, is, is not, real, it's not, real, not real hard, but man, it's, it's important for us to, for us to, for us to do. When I, when I think about, um, I thought about Elizabeth as I was preparing and I was thinking about, and God, I've got to work so hard not to let what I want rob me of what I have. And I thought about my wife and yeah, you know, I tell you all the time, I married her for her money, and then she quit her job. And, uh, and, um, but the true story is, the true story is, um, um, see, Mom, I don't just embellish the truth about you. I do it about my wife, too. The, the true story is, we got married, and Elizabeth did very well. She, she was very, very successful. And, um, um, and she did make a lot more money than, than me. Um, but... Um, that's not why I married her. I married her because she begged me to. And, <laughs> which, which, oh, I, I should not have said that. <laughs> Rewind. Um, what I meant to say is I begged her to. Um, um, but we were having, you know, our, our son was premature and was going to require, you know, real medical attention. And, and the Lord spoke to her in a moment and said, Elizabeth, you've never really learned to depend on me because you've always been able to depend on yourself. Your, your money has become your confidence. And um, so she quit her job. 
and she, um, she refused to allow what she wanted, which was to be more successful and have even more, um, to rob her of what she had, and that was this moment with her son. And, and this, this time to learn that when God is all you have, it's only then that you learn God is all you need. Listen, 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 you can hear it. You can hear it. I can preach it. I can tell you stories about it. But listen, until, listen, until you get to a place in your life where God is all you have, you never will really know that he is all you need. And it's important. It's important for us to to remember that number three write this down I'm going to turn my blessings blessings that I have into praise I'll, I'll turn every blessing I have back into praise why why is it important to do that? here's the reason why listen because if, if you get blessings and if you don't turn your blessings back into praise it will become pride you, you either turn your blessings back into praise or your blessings become pride. Either I look at my blessings and I say, look how good I am, look how good I've done, look what I've accomplished, or, and I become prideful, or I can take every blessing and I can say, look how good God is. God, thank you for being so good. I celebrate your goodness in, 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 in my life. Uh, David, he... He writes in Psalms, it's such a powerful picture of, of kind of the way that we want to keep our hearts postured. And this is what he said in, in Psalm 63, beginning in verse 4. He says, I will praise you as long as I live. and your name, I will lift my hands. I will be fully satisfied, God, because of your goodness. In other words, I'm not going to let what I want rob me of what I have. I will be fully satisfied. Why? Just because you're good. Just because God is so good. Do you know that God is good? God's eternally good. God's consistently good. God's faithfully good. There's never a moment that God's not good. God can't not be good. God is good, and he's good all the time. And David said, I will be satisfied in this, that you're good. I'm not satisfied because you give me everything I want. I'll be satisfied just because you are good. How do you, how do you, how do you turn your blessing back into praise. Let me, let me tell you a story and then I'll give you uh, uh, um, some homework. Here's the story. Um, just a little picture of, of, of a time in our life where God um, changed my perspective about being thankful. We were, um, years ago, our kids were small. We had gone on a cruise and um, it wasn't a Disney cruise. It was like a a, a carnival cruise and we didn't care about all the characters because we had sun we're getting out of the cold we had good food we had bunk beds that the kids could jump off of and we had free ice cream and um and we went but the problem was we we left the cold in the winter we did it in the winter i think it's february and we went to get away from the cold but we get on the cruise ship and it's rainy and it's cold you remember it's like we can't you can't really do anything that you go on a cruise to do except eat and um that wasn't what we were, we weren't really enjoying ourselves. And we we're like, oh, we paid for this. You know, we deserve sunshine and yada, yada, yada. And um, uh, several days in, you know, weather broke a little bit. Took the kids out to have a little fun. Still too cold for me and Elizabeth. But the kids, they got tired real fast. They just wanted to go back to the arcade, which is their third favorite thing on a cruise ship. You, you know, number one is the slides at the pool. Number two is the free ice cream machine. And number three is the arcade. So we go to the arcade. We're playing these games. And... Um, and I was responsible for the kids. Elizabeth wasn't even with me, but I had my eye on the kids. And my son, Harrison, disappears. He's gone. You ever had a kid disappear? You know that sinking feeling? My kid's gone. Couldn't find him. You know, Hope, help me find Harrison. We're trying to find Harrison. He's nowhere. And it seemed like an eternity, but it was just a few minutes later. And um, as, as, uh, as Harrison comes walking out of the boys' room, and he's buttoning his pants, and he's 
pull, pulling in. I'm like, ah, oh, Harrison had to go do his business. He just didn't tell me he had business to go do, and he disappeared. You know, my, my son's gone. But all of a sudden in that moment, when I see my son, how many know everything changed in that moment? Because that day that went from, anybody had a day that was bad, and then it got worse? Anybody ever had one of those days? So that's where I was. Oh, bad day. Weather's bad. Poor me. Can't do what I paid to do. Poor me. Wow, 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 wow. Now my son disappears. It goes from bad to really bad. My son's gone. All of a sudden, weather doesn't matter because now my son's gone. But my kid came out of the bathroom. He reappeared again. My son showed up and everything changed, but nothing changed. Except my perspective. So that's my story. Now let me give you homework. This week, I want, you to, I want you to practice something every day. Every day, I promise. If you'll do it for a week, it'll change you forever. Practice every day. Right now, I want you to get something in your mind that you really love, something you have that you love. What is it? I don't know. Something you love, your, your spouse, your kids, or you know, your car, your job, or your house. Or You have something that you love, your health. What is it that you love? Get it? Okay, boom, it's gone. You had health, but you just went to the doctor, and now you've just discovered that you've got a terminal disease. Your health is gone. You had a beautiful spouse or wonderful mother and father, kids that you loved, and one of them, two of them, three of them, they're gone. They just, they just passed. They're gone. You had a job. You had a job, but all of a sudden, layoffs come. Economy fails. Your job's gone. You no longer have your job. You had it. You loved it. Think about it. Now you've lost it. Think about it. What happens if you lose your home? What happens if you lose your health? What happens if you lose your spouse? All right, come at it. Boom, you got it back. All of a sudden, everything changes. I've got my health back. You mean I'm not terminal? You mean I'm not going to die? I know I've got hair growing in the wrong places. I know I'm losing hair. I'm not supposed to. I know I'm overweight. I don't like my body. But I've got my health back. Are you kidding me? You didn't lose your job. Oh, it's not a big deal. I didn't like that job anyway. Oh, it was a big deal whenever you lost it. Now you've got it back. That loved one didn't die. Your spouse is still there. Your siblings are still there. Your, your family, your loved ones, they're, they're, they're still there. They're, they, you didn't lose them. You, you got them back. And all of a sudden, everything, everything in that moment changes. Every, don't lose the power of the moment because you want a new car. You want to, you, you're driving around, you know, an old junker. And, and you, they hear you before they see you. And, 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 and everything that should work doesn't work. And I want a new car. I want a new car. Well, all of a sudden, you lose your car. And you get your car back. See how grateful you are to have the car you have? My house is always a mess. It's always a mess. I can't keep the house clean. These kids, this husband of mine, they're just always messing up the house. You lost your husband. You lost a child. Your house is clean. But you lost your child. Oh no, you got your child back. Your husband's back. Oh, but your house is still a mess. Oh, God, forgive me, please. I don't care about the messy house. I got my spouse back. I got my kid back. Every day this week, think of the things you love. Imagine losing them. And then imagine getting them back. It changes everything. Everything. Like nothing changed. But everything changed. And the only thing that really changed was your mind. Your attitude. My prayer is for you over this Thanksgiving season, this holiday season, that you will, that you will um, ask God to posture you. Posture your heart. Posture your mind. 
to be grateful. Anybody, anybody here, you want to be in a position of gratefulness? Any posture to be grateful? Listen, hey, grateful people are good-looking people. Grateful people are happy people. Grateful people are better people. Grateful people have more friends than ungrateful people. Because thankfulness, gratefulness is attractive. It's why families that don't get along, they don't even like each other. They love coming together on Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving reminds them that we do have a lot to be thankful for. Father, right now, you saw every hand that was raised. You know every heart. Lord, I just ask you to start in me. God, begin in me, and then, God, work in us. If there be anything in our lives that, that are not postured for gratefulness, if there's any area of our life that we feel entitled, like, I deserve this. I worked for this. This is mine. God, if there are any, if there are any places in us that cause us to be prideful and cause us not to be grateful transform our heart renew our mind for your glory God give us the courage to always remember that everything good we have has come from you help us to remember not to allow what we want to rob us of what we have God may we never ever forget to turn everything good back into praise so we do not become prideful. God help us to remember what life would be like if we lost what we love and be grateful for every moment that we still have it. Do that work in us today. In your strong name we pray, amen. While you're still here, there's some of you that are here today and you want to be grateful. You want to have a grateful heart. You want God to posture your heart toward gratefulness, but the reality is you're not very grateful toward God right now. Maybe things happen that you don't understand. Maybe there's some some questions or some bitterness. And um, it's hard for you to be a grateful person because you're not even grateful right now really towards your creator and the Holy Spirit may be tapping on your heart and the Holy Spirit may be drawing you back to Christ because Christ doesn't just want you he wants you at your best and outside of Christ it's hard to be grateful Christ is calling you to himself right now. Listen, I tell you all the time, you know, I'm not telling you to come to Jesus because you're going to die tonight. I'm telling you, come to Jesus because you're going to live tomorrow. And living with Jesus is better than living without Jesus. And today, maybe you're here. I think we had 16 people in the first service who gave their lives to Jesus today. And here's what I know. Yeah, go ahead. That's awesome. But God's not finished. Because there's people, people now, who the Holy Spirit's tapping on your heart. If the Lord's calling you, maybe you once walked with Jesus, but you've walked away. Maybe you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. Today, God brought you here for a reason. And I just want to encourage you step into relationship with Jesus and allow that relationship to change your life forever if you're here you'd say Scott that's me pray for me please pray for me I want you just to raise your hand I want to pray with you just raise your hand I bless you I see you anybody else raise your hand I bless you I see you I bless you in the back bless you I bless you I see you anybody else just raise your hand I want to see you God bless you sir ma'am a beautiful couple thank you God bless you. God bless you. I see you. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. All of you right here. God bless you. God bless you all. God bless you, ma'am. Anybody on this side of the room, God bless you in the very back. I see you. I see you. God bless you. 
God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you in the back. I see you. I see you, ma'am. I saw you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. I'm going to ask you to do something. I did this in the last service, and I want to just do it again. If you raise your hand and you meant it, I'd never embarrass you for anything, but I want to bless you. I'm going to bless you with relationship, with friendship. I'm going to bless you with people to pray with you. If you raise your hand and you meant it, if you raise your hand and you meant it, would you just stand right now? You don't have to come forward today. Just, just stand where you are. You meant it. Just stand on your feet. So, 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 so good. The Bible says that all of heaven is rejoicing right now. Here's what I want you to do. I want you just to remain standing if, if, you, if, you, if you're going to pray this prayer. And if you're in this room and you're a believer, you're a follower of Jesus, and there's somebody standing beside you, that means you're, you're, you're taking on a new brother. You're taking on a new sister. Your family's growing today. Why don't you go to that new family member right now and pray this prayer with them? So come on. If, you, if you're here in the room and you're a follower of Jesus and there's somebody standing around you, why don't you go to them? Right now, find somebody to partner up with and, and pray with them. Nobody's standing alone. Everybody find somebody. Let's pray together. Come on, let's pray this prayer. Everybody out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, you said that if I confess, I would find forgiveness. And I ask you now to forgive me of everything in me that isn't like you. Use me as an asset to your kingdom. Surround me with people that will encourage me. Give me strength to live for you. Empower me through your Holy Spirit. From this day forward, my life is yours, and I'm gonna live for you. In your strong, strong name, I pray these things. Amen, amen, and amen. Come on, one more time, can you just celebrate what God did? If you raised your hand and you prayed that prayer, you'd like us to give you some more information to contact you about a next step class, fill out one of those cards in the seat, drop it by Cornerstone Central, let us know to pray for you, get you started right on your journey. God bless you guys. I love you.